Okay. Um, yesterday, no, the day before yesterday, um, Fanwis Villion introduced the concept of cratons while he was talking about diamonds. And um, he also mentioned Clifford's rule, um, which is, has been one of the um, staples for uh, area selection in diamond exploration for a long time. And Clifford's rule was, of course, established long before we had any Kimberlite dates. We didn't know that all these rocks that in these uh, in these metallogenic provinces that he was looking at, the shields of Southern Africa, that they were actually Archean. So, but later on, people found out uh, more about dates of Kimberlites, of, of sorry, of country rock and diamonds. And we now know that primary diamond deposits tend to occur at Archean cratons. What I want to talk about is the, is the fact that not all cratons are born equal. And um, we have, just a minute now, why don't I get my, oh, here we are. Not all cratons are born equal and some have diamonds, some don't. And so what I want to do, I want to discuss the two. I initially said I was going to discuss the slave province, but I will add the superior province to it and compare this to the Kapval Craton, which of course is the type example of diamondiferous of a diamondiferous craton. Then afterwards I will derive some general conclusions about Clifford's rule and ex, uh, exploration strategies. You can see here, uh, mines are very unevenly distributed in the world. There's Siberia on the, um, maybe I should take a different pointer, huh? Pointer options, neither. Here is um, uh, Siberia, then of course, Southern Africa here. Uh, there is a bit more now up here in the Baltic field in, in the uh, Arkhangelsk area. But then there are the new areas here in uh, Canada, the Slave province and the big superior province here down here where we have also now two diamond mines. Um, okay, most cratons can be described in what I refer to as a life cycle of what I call the life cycle of diamondiferous cratons. It starts out whenever we have, uh, where we have a, a diamond mine that is uh, at least the ones that have behaved like the ones in the Kapwal Craton. We start with the um, earliest continental nu nuclei, which have um, P, type, this is peridotitic Hartsburgite type diamonds, and they are old. Then, um, and they are probably worldwide. And as soon as we come later into the Archean, uh, down here I have shown, this is the P-type diamond way down in the time scale in the Mesoarchean, uh, Periarchean boundary here. The stage two, after we have these uh, diamonds there, um, usually nuclei can combine the early nuclei and um, there are the first E-type diamonds formed and any periodic diamond that forms later is usually a lerzolite. Now the uh, end of the Archean, around 2.5 billion years, is usually the cratonization of the uh, uh, of most cratons. Kapval is different, as we will talk about. After these first diamonds are formed, it's usually a question of survival for the diamonds in the mantle roots. There are more diamonds added, E types and lerzolitic types, but it's more because cratons break up, they get involved in younger orogenies. They are surrounded by various protozoic mountain belts and so forth. So it's, we have to figure out in a, when we look at a craton and then analyze it, 
what are the processes there that try to destroy the diamond, the different mantle roots. And then of course, at some time, the kimberlite is intruded and, <clears throat> or kimberlites are intruded. There could be several uh, sets, of course. And that is usually younger than 1.8. And well, the oldest that is a good mine is the premier mine or the Cullinan mine, 1.2 or so. And so and this goes, of course, can be as young as the Eocene as uh, we have certain pipes in the like the ground field in the slave province. At that time, we might have, uh, or shortly before the Kimberlite eruption, we often have fibrous growths, overgrowths, uh, or fibrous uh, pubes forming by themselves. Then we might have megacrisp related diamonds. And at that time, of course, the uh, sublithospheric diamonds will be will be um, introduced as well, although they are then probably older and they come from deeper. And the final thing is after the uh, emplacement of the pipe, the, we have to worry about where the pipes are preserved and how the indicator minerals are dispersed. We won't go much uh, into that. Okay, it all starts out with that early event that I was talking about. This is a uniquely Archean event, and uh, it was, of course, recognized in South Africa. The, the uh, seminal reference there is the Boyd and Gurney 18, uh, 1986 reference, Diamonds in the African Lithosphere where they have studied all the garnets that come out of kimberlites. And in the diagram at the upper left, you can see the Kapwal craton here. Every pipe there has subcalcic garnets. There is the edge of Zimbabwe, this must be a weapon and so on. And then off craton, you do not find these kinds of garnets, as you can see. And there's a cross section that has been drawn from the Strickler land all the way to Laurentia in, in um, uh, Namibia, in fact, right across Southern Africa. And here you can see what became the, um, the uh, type example of a lysospheric root. These are the xenoliths that come uh, in, in diamonds, of course, that come from below the diamond graphite inversion curve and uh, to up to the bottom of the lithosphere. That's really what we're looking for in a diamond of his craton, a deep root with um, hard spergitic and uh, depleted rocks in them. And the inclusions of diamonds, uh, here this is a diagram from 1993, uh, they show, of course, that the um, garnets that are included in diamonds are very subcalcic. This is heavily biased here by Finch, but nevertheless, you can see that here is the famous 85% line of um, John Gurney's. Essentially, uh, separating Lerzolite and Harsvigat. The ages, of course, we know now much more about ages of diamonds. And when you compare them on different cratons, you can really see that, that if there are diamond mines, the early event is 3.5, 3.2 to 3.5 event with the hard spergitic diamonds goes worldwide. There are in, in they're rarely even the exceptional mines like um, Australia, Argyle, you can recognize in the mantle sample remnants of an early, um, uh, early mantle root that was uh, hard spaghetti. Now, when it comes after that, we have, we have all kinds of different dates, okay? Sometimes a lot of events here, like in Southern Africa, we have lerzolites forming in Premier. We have them in Forcefoot. There was a recent paper by Karen Smith 
who uh, has discovered the the force foot uh, lazulitic diamonds they are probably related to um, which event was that oh yeah that was the 2.7 um, and what's the what's the soup 2.7 in South Africa and the famous green lavas that are all around Kimberley. Then the force puts here that was the Ungerluk lavas. I will come back to that, I might remember. But now when you see the slave province here, you see only one later diamond event, an E-type event. You can see lamprophires that have uh, diamonds. In the superior, we have two ended. We have some that are here and questionable. We haven't got nearly as many dates, of course. And then recently, the Victor mine, where we found out that most of these diamonds are 0.72 um, giga n, so they are in late Precambrian, in other words. And, and that is, there are some very different processes going on, and I want to talk about those. Okay, then we have various detrital diamonds coming in, which I will also talk about because it used to be for a long time that people just simply could not believe that diamonds are that old. And that today still people don't have any trust in the ages of inclusion and of dated mineral inclusions from diamonds. But uh, we do have several places where we have the trinal diamonds, 2.96 uh, billion years old in the slave now, and of course the famous Bitwatersrand diamonds, which are 2.85 uh, billion years old. So um, with that introduction, let's go uh, into um, the uh, two cratons from North America, the Slave Province and the Superior Province. The Slave Province is up here in that yellow circle and the um, Superior Province is here on the southeastern part of the shield. You can see that all these Archean parts, they're in red. Some of them are reworked Archean parts in the Perizoica, like the Churchill Province. But then there are also uh, Proterozoic mobile belts uh, surrounding them here in, in the Slave Province and here the Trans Hudson Belt that goes right across or around the Superior Province. And here, of course, in the Grenville bounding the Superior Cranton on the bottom. Zeroing in on the slave province itself, the, um, you can see the slave province there surrounded by the mobile belts. And let me just bring out some of the questions that we want to ask. We want to look at the, briefly at the tectonic setting and the geological setting. Then where are the kimberlites? We want to find where are the diamonds, which kimberlites are diamond and what are the diamond ages? How did they form? That's not all that clear, but uh, that would be an interesting thing to find out. Where and how did they survive the diamonds? What was the role of paleoperozoic intrusions? The Canadian shield that shot through with diamond dikes and intrusions, and if they influenced the survival of these diamondiferous roots? Are there role, the regional faults, the role of the regional faults, then in the slave province specifically, the role of the Mackenzie plume. And uh, we can also briefly talk about the controls of Kimberlite volcanism in this part of the world. Here is the slave province just by itself. You can see um, uh, here all the geology. This is essentially a granite greenstone terrain where um, some parts of the, um, I should say, essentially a neo Archean granite greenstone terrain where some parts, and you can see here these, these um, violet or these purple parts, has a basement. There is a basement terrain here, which we call the central slave superterrain. You can see it here without the geology. 
um, in this right diagram. And it has characterized all the sulfides in that, in the uh, primary sulfide bearing rocks, like um, massive sulfide deposits and so on. They are, they have evolved lead isotopes. So they show that there was a basement present. The rest of the areas around this are accreted terrains. You can see them here on the eastern side of the central slave super terrain, the Contoido terrain, the Hackett River terrain, Council terrain, and there is here a small one that's called the Snare terrain on the west side. And these uh, are juvenile Archean, uh, neo Archean rocks. Now the kimberlites in the, you can see all the black symbols here are kimberlites. Most of the kimberlites occurred throughout here, which is the contoidal terrain. But we know that this contoidal and the capsule terrain that there are uh, allothenous on the basement of the central slave super terrain. So there are neo archean rocks thrust over Paleo, uh, Mesoarchean to Paleoarchean rocks. And uh, we know the kimberlites uh, that come through here actually have xenoliths of this 3.2 billion years up to that age. Okay, let's go next. And um, this is a diagram. If I go back here, uh, this goes right across these different terrains, and you see the stylized uh, stratigraphic, oops, sorry, the uh, stylized stratigraphic columns, and you can see that the central super ter terrain, um, central slave super terrain has a basement, and all the other rocks are neo archaean And uh, just to give you an idea what they're like, the, um, the, Central slave um, super terrain, oldest part is actually on the margin of the province. It's the, the cast and ice complex, which has rocks up to 4 billion years old, some of the oldest rocks in the world. The uh, next, um, this basement in many parts, wherever we see it outcropping and where it's not too badly reworked has a quartzite sequence, which is referred to as a central slave cover group. You can see here the unconformity of that quartzite on basement rocks. And you can see here some of the, some of the uh, cross bedding in the quartzite. So a very mature uh, sediment, which uh, as we have figured out is quite equivalent, although it's very much uh, less, um, we have far less of it. It's like the Witwaters Rand sequence. It has the same age, it's 2.9. In this particular case, it ranges from 2.96 to 2.85. And um, that is now overlain either tectonically, and that's a big argument amongst the geologists, by neo archean um, uh, rocks here, uh, the pillow flows, and that's in the central. That's where uh, you can see in the center here. That's probably that age, these volcanic rocks. They're 2.72 uh, and slightly younger. Then they're overlain by uh, turbidites, and that is again unconformably overlain by a polymictic conglomerate, which is up here in this. And the entire sequence is deformed. And the, pre the uh, early uh, Precambrian rocks here are redeformed together with this neo archean sequence. And at the end of it all, at the end of the Archean, 2.6 uh, to 2.58, we have enormous amounts of granites, which is referred to as a granite bloom. So uh, that is the geologic setting in a nutshell. Um, and now where are the kimberlites? We have so far 
the province has been pretty well explored, although there are many, many more mines to find as far as I'm concerned. But a lot of kimberlites have been discovered and they are basically subdivided into five fields. And uh, they are, that's the Ikati, the, the uh, lactograph field where the Ikati and Dyvik mines are, which is late, late Cretaceous to early uh, tertiary in age, 75 to 45 million years old, some of the youngest kimberlite pipes. Then there's Jurassic pipes here in the Jericho field. There was one mine, the Jericho mine in there. In the Southern Slave Province, which is Cambrian, 530, there's two mines, the Snap Lake and the Guachup Cay. And then there are two fields here, the Coronation Field, which is latest pre-Cambrian, 630. Yeah, 13 is the only number we have, 613 million years of age, which is Ediacaran. And this one here, the Western Slave, is some order vision Silurian in age. Now I've drawn this line here, which is a, a, a very prominent fault, the so-called Benaya fault that goes through here. And all diamond mines are to the east of it, near Kimberlites to the west of it. And the kimberlites are still in the central slave superterrain. So all kimberlites are related to this basement here and uh, to the uh, parts of the basement that are covered by the neo, neo archean Alothenus rocks that lie on top of it here on this side. But diamonds are restricted to the west side where this. Um, Terrain is deeply covered by the by the uh, new Archean rocks. I will show you sections about that later on. Just an example. This is the, the first pit that was mined, the Panda Pit. There's about this picture of the diamonds there. I took that on the that was exhibited in the Cavi. Um, uh, office and that's 10,800 carats and at that time this was taken I think in 2004 and at that time that was one day's production of that mine so it was in small pipes but rich pipes in the in the grades are carats per ton rather than 100 carats per ton uh, sorry then uh, carats per 100 tons the pipes are quite unusual. They're different. They're smaller, much smaller than the uh, Southern African types. They're essentially big holes blown into the into the country rock, or most often granitic rocks. And the kimberlite infill is pyroclastic and resedimented pyroclastic. Only the Cambrian um, kimberlites that we have in the southeastern part of the slate print are more like the, the um, southern African ones. And this is a figure from Scott Smith. It has root sown and it has definitely a diatreme type facies. And this is the part that is preserved. So the pipes are slightly different and the mines consist of smaller pipes, but several pipes each time. And um, so the overall um, resources are quite high in, in many of them. The best example here is the koala pit that gives you an idea you know, of the size. They're all in the they range from three hectares to about 17 hectares uh, surface area. They are uh, steep walled. Here you can see the horizontal infill. And here you can see a sample of the, this is almost like an olivine sand with garnets in it. And the diamonds from that pipe look quite pretty. And these are, these, these are just covered uh, with as, uh, very thin fibrous coatings. One uh, particular um, interest, one very interesting part is that these pipes contain wood. The resedimented, the kimberlites obviously were intruded into a swampy terrain where the um, where the 
where there were lots of trees, mainly sequoia type trees. And here you can see the largest wood fragment that was found in the misery pipe. There is the light switch and this is a normal door. So that is a real part of a stem, as you can see. There is another tree stem right there. And on a field trip once, uh, I think it was the IKC in 2003, yeah. Um, people didn't believe that this was actually wood. So I had brought a lighter along and you can, can't see the smoke coming up, but you can see here there's ashes and uh, the, the wood actually burns. You can take it out of the outcrop and burn it. So, that shows that the infilling was um, uh, from these swampy trees. There were fish uh, and uh, turtle fossils swamped in as well. So it is a very interesting kind of assemblage. So that's the, the kimberlites. Now, where are the diamonds in terms of age and where do they fit into the um, scale? They definitely, um, the, the uh, lactic pipes and the ones in the Southern Pyramid have all kinds of the hard spaghetti diamonds and they have been dated uh, by two, uh, in two places by, at, at about 3.5 gigan. Then instead of having early, there's no uh, Archean E-types, to speak of, it's been found, but a lot of uh, E-type diamonds and garnets and eclogites are approximately 1.86 billion years old. They came much later, in other words, post uh, Archean. Then, of course, I've uh, put the kimberlites here on the right. That is what we call the kimberlite barcode of it, and it's, 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 it's five generations. And each one may have diamonds. All of them do have diamonds, and uh, in some of them, they haven't really survived very much, but all have an original remnant of these hard spaghetti diamonds. And people, of course, have doubted the age in, in, of these kimberlites, um, of these diamonds. Uh, being 3.5 billion years old and then surviving under a Neoarchean greenstone belt sequence that was too hard to swallow for many people. And, but um, already quite a while ago, we had found um, a survey had studied some of this cover group sequence, which is here. There's the basement and there's this quartzitic cover group. And there's some small diamonds in it. And unfortunately, early diamonds got lost, but very recently, the people from the uh, University of Alberta, which is Graham Pearson, <coughs> resampled this rock. They found diamonds in it. So, so we now know there are detrital diamonds in that. So pre all the greenstone belt sequences in neo archean greenstone belts, we have already detrital diamonds in the sequence, very much like in South Africa in the Witwatersrand. There is one more uh, thing that comes here. We have also in the um, Archean, in the Neo Archean itself, we have lamprophyr dikes uh, that are also, some of them also have microdiamonds. Here's just to show you that's what that quartzite uh, conglomerate looked like in the cover sequence that has these diamonds in them. There, that's where the diamonds are. And here you can see where the zircons that are the detrital zircons that are dated to, in the upper intercept here is two uh, for this particular bunch is uh, 2,935 million years plus or minus a bit. So they're all diamonds there predating the, the um, New York and Greenstone belts. Now this dike that I was talking about, the, this is um, the John Armstrong standing in near Yellowknife near one of those dikes. And when, when you go and look at this particular sample, there's a bunch of xenoliths in there and they have been known for quite a while. 
They are 3.2 billion years old, so they sit underneath the Neoarchean deformed rocks in the 3.2 billion year ages. They have been checked several times here. And this dike is known to have some microdiamonds, not much, but um, you can get consistently microdiamonds out of it. So the model of the Archean evolution is um, of the province is quite simple. Um, we had an early terrain that was paleo to Mesoarchean that rifted apart here. You can see that we don't know where this piece went. It's absolutely not, it has not been found, but it must have had a P-type root and um, the next stage then, after the rifting, we had all these Neo-Archean terrains form and uh, they then amalgamated. Here is the Hackett River Arch, it is an arc, and there is a central volcanic belt arc and there is a snare arc and so on. And they then all amalgamated in the lower diagram and um, that was followed. It's all together, and you can see here these these um, Neoarchean rocks over top of the Mesoarchean basement, and that's where the Kimberlites with the diamonds are. So here is the diamondiferous root, and it's best preserved in the eastern part of that central slave superterrane, where it's covered by these rocks. Now, the E-type diamonds, which are more common in the uh, Jericho uh, Kimberlites, the Jurassic Kimberlites, but also present in the um, Akati and Diavig mine, they came um, with a huge slab that was subducted from the west underneath the Slave province. The first sections that we had, uh, these are, uh, that's a mixture of a, um, reflection seismic with um, teleseismic here and people had argued for a long time how old these various slabs are that go under this we can trace them all the way back to an 1800 million year uh, for its terrain. and recently this was lithoprope uh, by 2005 in 2010, uh, Oedie and Close made a re, um, they reprocessed this section and they used crooked line um, acquisition so that they could have a three dimensional picture. And they came up with this wonderful slab that goes down there. And that fits into here. And that means this part here is part of that slab going down because they're comes right to there and it's about the right depth, 110, 120 kilometers. So that's where the interface of the old basement to the top and the young understrusted slab is. And that's where the E-type diamonds are related to it. And when we summarize all that, we have a, an asymmetric part of the, um, of the uh, basement part here. And uh, <clears throat> that's where the um, P-type diamonds sit in. And we have the uh, Proterozoic rocks going underneath. We don't really exactly know what's happening in the Eastern part. All we know is that the Eastern terrains were overthrust here because we can see the xenoliths in the Kimberlites that sit in the juvenile terrains. So we know that's uh, uh, a lochtonous on top of it, but we don't know precisely what's going on here. So the E-type diamonds, uh, they came, oh, sorry, the they, they first, all that, all that um, neo-archean activity, and there's this massive granite bloom related to it, and there are um, base metal deposits with it and there are gold deposits with it. And then the next step in it was that the E-time diamonds went underneath. <coughs> and you can then, in other words, say that this 
paleo to Mesoarchean mantle root was actually uh, totally underplated by these E-type rocks. And in fact, the Proterozoic um, slab underneath the um, depleted uh, keel protected that uh, keel from being eroded thermally or tectonically further. So I better go move on. Then the kimberlites came through. We can see the Western kimberlites don't have any diamonds because much of that route was already uh, um, taken, eroded by the Proterozoic events. But here, these kimberlites have the diamonds. Okay, now the role of the uh, of the uh, Proterozoic intrusions, the dikes, in either controlling emplacement or causing uh, deterioration of the mantle root. Uh, what I've done here is this this part of the uh, stratigraphic sequence. That's the um, barcode for the paleoproterozoic dikes forms, they're mainly related to, to um, rifting within the province and so on. And here they are, you, here you can see them in spatial context, it's the same dike swarms. Here's the entire province. This is where most of the kimberlites are. And the one dike swarm that seems to have uh, a relationship or that the kimberlites may have followed in some fashion is this one, the like the ground um, swarm, which, um, which has um, some of the mines controlled along it, I showed in a second. There were other intrusions here, uh, alkali complexes, and they have probably metasomatized this part of the mantle root, which was also tectonically eroded. So that's where there are no diamonds here. And that's where there's diamonds surviving in this part of the world. This is the picture just to show you that dike swarm, the, the Lac de Grand corridor that is, it has one, two, three mines along it. That's the Cambrian mine, Snap Lake, and the Caddy and the uh, Diamond mine here. And you can see this, these are the pipes that are known of the uh, Lac de Gras Kimberlite field. And there are the, that's where the Caddy mine is, and that's where the corridor of the, of the um, Ivic mine is. There, about two million, one is 55 million years old, and one is 53 million years old, and each one has several pipes along that strike. Faults um, don't play a great role except one here. These are all perizoic faults, and these are the dikes again, but these are all the faults that have been mapped, major faults. And most of those are related to the um, proterozoic deformation and um, of the Slate province when it was indenting the uh, this area here. And but there are some Archean faults that have been remobilized in amongst them is this important one here that all the diamonds are staying, uh, diamondiferous pipes are on this side. And um, that pipe, that fault actually, the protozoic reactivation part of that fault zone crops out and the fault zone itself has a lot of the late Archean conglomerates along it, here in this one, in this particular one. And the recent, uh, I should say recent, I mean the paleoprozoic displacement, it's about 15 kilometers long and it's an oblique slip. Here is the western side of that fault corridor, which is the west, which is also a protozoic fault, but following an earlier Archean fault, the Yellowknife fault zone. And um, they are very prominent, and that's in the picture is right there. So that's where still kimberlites occur, but they don't have diamonds. 
to speak of. And on the west side, on the east side of this one, that's where the mines are. Now, the major event that affected the um, province was the um, Mackenzie plume, which intruded, uh, which was probably the center of the plume was here. And uh, here we can see a study that was done by uh, Richard Ernst and Berger. Uh, the dikes uh, intruded vertically here uh, and then horizontally in this part of the world. So the circle of 500 kilometers around the radius here, the uh, dikes started to go from vertical to horizontal. And that is where the diamonds survive up here in the northern part of the Slave province. There is very little in terms of, this is the circle here now. And Herb, uh, Herb, you've got about 15 minutes. Yes, I have to move a lot faster. Okay, that's where the diamonds are gone in this part of the world, in Jer Jericho. Jericho was mined, but it wasn't very uh, rich mine. It's not mined anymore. And this is where all the diamonds happily survived. Okay, so let me go further. Let me go to the Sicarium province briefly. The, the Superior Province is much bigger. It is also surrounded by Proterozoic belts, as you can see here. Um, and the, the size difference, that's the Slave Province there up on the upper left. And the Slave Province fits into this part of the Superior Province quite comfortably here when you, when you um, turn it around a bit to the right. So uh, the uh, province, the size difference is profound. And here I come to a bit of a comparison. We know, for instance, the slave province has only about 200,000 square kilometers. That's 10 to the five up there. The Kapha Kratom, 1.2, 10 to the six. So this is over a million square kilometers. The Superior Province has 1.57, it's even bigger. But you can see that when we compare the Slave Province and the Superior Province here, um, the greenstone sequences are these, and this is the basement terrains. We, while there was a lot of Archean, neo Archean activity going on. The Ventersdorf volcanics were intruded here, and they simply stitched the eastern and western part of the Kapha crater. So they were already, the cr craterization of the Kapha crater happened here with Water Rand with the trital diamonds, right? And the, the, that's the basement. Whereas the other cratons, the um, Zimbabwe included, Superior, and Slave, have a lot of Neo-Archean overprint over this. But the Neo-Archean rocks don't generally have uh, many, many, um, uh, the, the Kimberlites in those parts don't show um, the, the depleted, uh, the, the uh, subcalcic garnets. So let's go further. This was what happened in, this, in the uh, Superior, uh, in the Kapha crater. And we have the, uh, the Eastern part coming under the Western part, the Kimberley block. And each one had their own P-type diamonds. And that's probably the 2.9 event that uh, showed the first uh, eclogitic ones. And then on top of it, we have the earliest um, Gridwater Strand diamonds that are preserved. So definitely Archean, but all meso to paleo Archean, uh, paleo to meso Archean. Here in the Superior Province, we also have detrital diamonds, but they're in the much later conglomerates. This is a 2.7 conglomerate here in the Wawa Greenstone Belt, for instance. The Superior Province, uh, Young's from the north to the south. And in this part here, we have 3.0 to 3.8 uh, billion year rocks, and they get younger downwards, but there are older terrains interspersed here in this southern part. So 
When you see the same diagram that I drew for the Slave province, here are all the greenstone terrains, the Neo-Archean, these are all the basements. You can see there are a few that have basement terrains, and, but only a few of these basement terrains are rather big. The Hudson's Bay terrain here and the Hudson's Bay terrain there. That is where the where the um, <coughs> and diamondiferous kimberlites are. And here, uh, this is where the detrital diamonds first came up to the surface. That's how the whole province came together, intruded, uh, 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 amalgamated from south to north. And we can, this is where the diamond of his Kimberlites are. That is, um, that is um, Renard and this is uh, Victor. And this is one of these older terrains that gets swamped in there. There's another one of these older terrains. So the old terrains are all concentrated in the north and there isn't much in terms of diamonds uh, to the south. Here are a bunch of sections that show, the lithoprobe sections show the remnants of subduction zones. That's in the eastern part of the province, and this is in the western superior. There are actually two sutra zones. Here are the old rocks, there are the old rocks, and there's all the younger rocks. And here are the diamond mines, the two, Renard and Victor. Victor is rather interesting. Um, because the Victor diamonds are 720 million years old, and that has uh, surprised a lot of people. So let me just go through that. They, this is here in the Atahualpa's Cap Kimberlite field, 0.72 um, um, billion, billion years to gigahertz. And that shows the Victor Kimberlite, or one of the Victor Kimberlites is like this. This is not the actual Victor itself, that's the U2 pipe, the Jurassic pipe. And there's an older generation nearby and that is overlain by a lot of Paleozoic rocks, whereas this one has penetrated the Paleozoic rocks. You see the, the T1 is this one here on that one and the U2 is that one. So they're very close together. And um, the students, uh, Richard, uh, sorry, Thomas Stuckel and the students have figured this out. Um, I will go past this one. The Kyle Lake, the T1 pipe, look at this. They have a lot of subcalcic garnets, whereas the uh, Victor, which is wonderful diamonds, doesn't have any. So oh, it has a few uh, hard spaghetti diamonds when you look at the plots of the actual pipe, but mainly they are all like this. And the inclusions in the diamonds are lerzolitic and they're 720 million years old. So it's one of these rare cases, it's a bit like the bush felt when the, when uh, an intrusion, and this was the, the um, Kivanovan event in the in the central uh, uh, superior province when that heated up. This is the original diamond situation that was heated up. All the diamonds got destroyed, and it cooled down, and it came back afterwards, and it formed beautiful, very very. Um, uh, pretty and very expensive, uh, 550 uh, dollars per carat uh, diamonds of the, of the uh, um, Victor mine. So it shows you that, that not everything is straightforward. Uh, there can be uh, late diamond forming events and uh, it pays to also um, take heed of the um, Lerzolitic garnets in the exploration. So I won't go through the others here. I will just sort of finish with my, oh yeah, just in the Southern part of the, of the province, Kirkland Lake, Kimberlites in there is absolutely zilch in the uh, depleted uh, uh, garnet field here. There's not, nothing there. And there's two reasons for that is, um, one is, uh, well, it has a hot geotherm, as you can see here on this side, compared to the Atahualpa's cut, which was a re-established 
normal geotherm after the uh, diamonds or when the diamonds were formed. But there's also a huge, huge uh, uh, dike swarm here, which is centered here somewhere. Uh, the the Kirkland and Kimberlites are right there. So they would be right in the influence of this plume, which was the Metashwan plume, 2.45 billion years old. And in addition to that, it's in, in the neo archean in the neo archean um, <clears throat> um, terrain, which doesn't have much of a mantle root left. So it, uh, I probably should wrap it up right here. The term archean craton has different meanings when referring to the Kapwa craton and the slave prominent superior prominent of the Canadian shield. The former is paleo to Mesoarchean and all parts of diamond perspective. In other words, that's why we saw all these, um, not every part of diamonds, but they all have uh, subcalcic garnets throughout. The um, activity, all the um, overprinting granites, granite blooms are all old. The Archean, you know, the Johannesburg granite is somewhere around 3 billion, if I remember right. So in the um, Slave and Superior province, there was much Neo-Archean um, um, activity and only the proto, the pre-Neo-Archean nuclei are really diamond prospective. So in Archean craton here, means that you have to go, the, the Clifford's rule should actually say, not Archean cratons, but it should say where there are Mesoarchean roots uh, to the craton and not the Neoarchean parts. They are not in, at least in the Slave province and in most parts of the Superior province, they're not diamond perspective at all. And um, so, yeah, that's, uh, that's essentially all I have to say here. And there's maybe some time for discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Herb. That was a very, that was a very well illustrated and comprehensive talk. Um, I learned quite a bit from it about the slave that I didn't know before. Uh, we do, do have some time for some questions or- um, Sure, sure, comment? sure. Yeah. Should I unshare or? Yeah, I think you, you could do, yeah. How do I do that? Uh, there should be a, a green button that should say, uh, un there you go, you managed it. Uh, Herb, just, you didn't say anything at all about the Churchill province. Is, any, is anything going on in the, in, in the Churchill? And, uh, there, there, are, there are Kimberlites in the Churchill province, and there are also older parts in it. I didn't say anything about it simply because there's no time. As you see, I already ran out of time now. Um, the, the Churchill province is different again. The, the Archean cratons like Superior and Slave they are neo-archean cratons, okay, and they cratonized at that time at 2.5. And the Churchill province, uh, part of it is a later belt, the Trans-Hudson belt, but uh, much of it is also archean terrain, but it got reworked again in the Proterozoic. So it got reworked in the archean, in the neo-archean, and in the Proterozoic. And uh, there are some Kimberlites, but the younger ones, for instance, the near Hudson's Bay, the younger ones don't have any diamonds. And there are a few older ones that have diamonds, but they are generally small. So um, there are some areas in the, uh, that are being explored now, uh, for instance, in the um, region on the northern part of Hudson's Bay. Um, and they um, may eventually end up with diamonds. Okay. And Herb, uh, John Brister here. So the million dollar question, I mean, are you in your models and differentiating say the Carpval history from your slave history, 
Um, you know, where does where does Andy's model fit in with the Clippers, or do you do you think? Well, um, well the Clippers. <clears throat> I don't know whether the Clippers have anything to do with the Archean history. The Clippers okay. come when the Kimberlite gets intruded, right? And mm -hmm. we think that the Clippers form just before somewhere in, the, in Andy's nice model with that uh, body cooling and all the fractures going out. That happens uh, more or less uh, 10 plus minus 10 million years before the Kimberlite eruption or at the Kimberlite eruption. It could be one part of the Kimberlite eruption. Um, so um, I don't think that has much to do with what the craton looks like. On the other hand, the the craton, the cupron craton, the type craton is really the only major craton in the world where paleoarchean blocks have come together at the end of the Mesoarchean and the action stops. Everything else is platformal afterwards. There's the Bushveld coming coming in. There are all these other um, events taking place, but the route down there stays still, right? There isn't all that much uh, apart from the from the bushveld happening to it. Hi, uh, Bill McKechnie here. Um, it was a very good talk. Thank you. It was very, very interesting. I, I was actually going to ask your opinion about the bushveld and its impact on the Cot Vol. It, it's quite interesting because the, the Bushveld complex is virtually surrounded by diamondiferous kimberlites right close to the edge. And you, we have one diamondiferous kimberlite sitting right in the middle uh, at Palmithat. It's got very strange diamonds, three populations of diamonds, uh, black, green, and, uh, and pure white. Uh, I don't, I think very few people have seen those things, but it's very, very interesting uh, kind of setup. You know, on the southwestern side, you've got uh, Swartrachens, you've got Juaneng sitting there over in the east, Marsmontane sitting up in the north, and Cullinan, uh, much older, um, you know, sitting on the southern edge of the uh, of the uh, Kalt Val, of the Bushveld.